So next speaker is Rohit Sharma. Uh, he's a founder of AI Technology and Systems. And he talks about the DNA compiler devices. And please welcome Rohit Sharma. Thank you. So we had a wonderful presentation before me, right? So there's a lot of data in there that you know I had in my slides. So I would be skipping those slides. Thank you very much for um, explaining that in detail. Uh, my attempt of this presentation is to sort of convince you guys that AI eventually will move to the edge, and I'm trying to, I would sort of present my reasons um, as to why, and in the end, I hope to. Um, um, I'll present the compiler that we are working on um, that works on smaller form factor devices, um, like microcontrollers um, worth 10 cents to few dollars. And uh, we are working with uh, you know, a few companies uh, to make that into reality. And the latest one is this. It's a microcontroller, has five different sensors, and it can do quite a few useful things. And it has our software running into this now. We have a few uh, uh, tutorials and examples that I'm going to show you. So with that, let's get started. Um, so my name is Rohit Sharma, and I work for companies like TI, Magma, Apache, uh, Cadence, and Parkhat, and currently working with the uh, AITS. Um, and uh, these are my social handles in case you want to reach out to me afterwards. Um, I'm happy to talk. Taxonomy, this audience is very smart, so I'm going to skip that slide pretty quickly. Um, you might have seen this slide multiple times. Um, people say different names. AI is pervasive like electricity. It's new oil. And you know, yesterday I heard in the AIoT conference, it's not oil, it's water. So um, use it with caution. And it's, it's, it's basically it's going to give you life um, kind of a thing. And uh, I do believe AI is the fourth industrial revolution um, after railroad and assembly lines, which gave us a lot of automation and connectivity. And uh, um, of course, digital in 1970s, where uh, the semiconductor, um, uh, you know, put us here where we can't imagine our lives without, um, you know, being surrounded by chips and microcontrollers. If you're sitting in the car, there are possibly you know, 15 microcontrollers around you doing different things. Um, and then, of course, uh, AI that we all are talking about, right? Um, and AI is like uh, the reason it's being compared to electricity is because by itself, it's not a science. It's not going to give you much in your daily lives. It's going to disrupt the industry, give you features, give you new products that you would use in your daily life, and make it simpler and more productive, just like electricity did, right? So from the time the electricity was um, discovered. To the time the bulb was invented, it was close to 70 years. Um, and if it is anything like that, we have to embrace ourselves for that multiple decades of evolution of AI. Um, and like I said, uh, we are surrounded by appliances. Um, you may not know at any time if you, um, you know, in your home, you, your, your refrigerators have um, microcontrollers, your washing machine, your dryers, um, you name it. You know, pretty much everything that runs on electricity likely has some form of microcontrollers ranging from few cents to several dollars. Um, and there are multiple of, of, you know, so these are just four examples um, that are multi-billion dollar opportunities that are growing year after year. Um, and to put the numbers on these, this is um, the recent 2018 um, report from um, Accenture, which does compare the baseline annual gross value uh, for two con uh, 12 countries that together generate more than 50% of the entire world's GDP. So, yeah, China is not included. <laughs> um, yeah, I did have that question myself when I looked at this graph. Where is China? AI in China has to be there. I, the, China is not there in that graph. But if you get curious, there is a link um, where it talks about the methodology and how did they come up with these numbers and stuff. Um, so it's a comparison of across 12 countries that together generate more than 50% of the world's economic output. And it shows that AI can open up opportunities to create value 
reinforcing the role of people to drive growth in businesses. And it's a comparison of uh, baseline annual gross value added growth in terms of percentage um, to a scenario where AI has been absorbed. So the orange line is essentially your baseline and the purple one is where AI has added value. And it's anywhere from 30% to almost uh, 100%. And this is a macro trend worldwide. It's 50% of the entire GDP, right? Um, so if you believe that, next decade is going to be very, very interesting. Um, and uh, so this is another um, comparison that I find interesting. And this is for pixels. Uh, the graph that you are looking at is essentially uh, sensors that are being produced on an annual basis. 2013 had about 2.6 billion. Um, and in 2020, we are going to surpass 8 billion, which is more than the world population, right? So why is the comparison of world's population to the sensors important? Uh, the reason is every one of us has one sensor um, that we're carrying around or relying on, right? And if you assume that sensors life is three years, then you know you have three sensors per person. Um, and what that sensors do is actually capture your pixels, what you're looking at. You're taking the picture um, and the data is being generated, right? So where does the data go? The data has to be either stored or transmitted to the cloud or processed somehow. So, um, and 99% of this new raw data is all pixels. Rest is audio and text. So this is phenomenal, right? Now, the reason I bring this comparison is when the data is being generated, and it has to be either stored or you know uh, either in your local device or or your network uh, where should that go right and now compare compare that to your bandwidth you have today um, and this graph is from wikipedia where it compares and shows you the uh, bandwidth um, in petabytes per month and if you translate that to per second it's 45 gigabytes per second and these are all the networks of this planet Earth. This is the data that they can carry, 45 gigabytes per second. Now compare that number to what we are generating from these sensors, which is 100 exabytes per second. So you see the difference um, between what we can support today, including 5G, to what we are generating, what we are capable of generating, which is 10 to power 19. And that is phenomenal. It's a difference of 10 to power 10. And it's not going to stop, it's only going to grow. And that is one convincing factor that something has to happen. If you cannot um, transport or you know, send your data to the cloud using the network, then you have to process it on the edge. And that um, is a one convincing <laughs> sort of uh, reason that edge is going to pick up. Uh, because our network bandwidth is simply not there. Um, even if you start catching today and double the bandwidth every year, it will take us 30 years before we are um, catching up to today. Um, so that's just one factor. Now, there are several other factors, right? Um, <clears throat> vision, pixel, pixels is one, which is um, you know, different by a uh, factor of 10 to power 10. Look at NLP. Um, the NLP models are fairly small. They can be as small as 13 kilobytes. Now imagine the joy if you could say, um, you know, to, to this uh, uh, projector uh, that connect to my laptop and it follows your command, right? Um, that's possible today um, in, a, in a $1 um, uh, microcontroller. And the reason is the, these, these models that some of these companies like Bevel Labs are working on, you can have the hot keyword along with 20 um, different words as a vocab under 13 kilobytes of memory, which is not a whole lot. And you don't require you know, too much processing power. You know, 40 megahertz of you know, ARM um, processor would do just good. So applications like this um, give me hope that you know, there, is, there is a lot of joy that we can draw from from the spread of AI technology into the edge devices. 
And the killer advantage of these edge devices are they're very, very inexpensive and they've been there for 40 years. And this, this is not something new. This is not coming in today. We had microcontrollers in 70s before microprocessors came along. Um, and then there are these uh, other applications that go on from biometric data, for example. Um, so, for example, 13 kilobytes, right? Um, so, there's a company called Bevel Labs. We hope to work with them. Um, and uh, they are working in this speech end to end speech recognition. Um, and they're um, training the deep um, learning models, which will give you um, uh, hot keyword recognition in 13 kilobytes and, uh, and uh, 20 uh, word vocab recognition in different languages, different accents. Um, under 108 kilobytes. So that's a very small memory footprint that you can run on any microcontroller less than a dollar. As long as it is a mic, you're all set to go, right? Yeah, right. So just like you talked to Google Home or Alexa today, right? The difference being for some reason, Google will you know, capture your audio and most of the processing would be done in the cloud. It just goes there and comes back. Now, there is no reason um, for that to happen if I'm asking Google Home or Alexa to turn off my light, which is in my personal area network. This is on my router. And you know the end device is right you know, three foot next to it. Why is it sending my command all the way there? If the bulb had that kind of uh, you know, microcontroller, you can talk to the bulb directly. You can just ask the bulb to turn off or adjust the, the brightness, right? So there is a lot of this bandwidth that's going waste because of the business reasons that these you know, larger companies have decided to collect the data off of you. There is no reason to. Um, so this could be one example, right? And there are several others. Um, your imagination is the limit. And these are some of the industries that I tried to collect, not enough. Um, this is not by means anything exhaustive. Um, you, can, you can think of any application that's running under 456 kilobytes and you, know, you have your application. Um, uh, opportunities, benefits, and challenges. Um, now we do talk about uh, most of the presentations that you might have heard that we need a lot of power, a lot of performance, um, you know, going into uh, petabytes per second. And, you know, last presentation was very useful in, you know, giving you that kind of data. But not everything requires that kind of data. For example, another example in the vision could be that if your door is open or not, it does not require 50 frames per second. Um, one frame per five seconds is good enough for you to detect if the door was open in that, you know, one second or five second period which these microcontrollers can carry out with a, with a webcam of $10, you add another 10 cents, and then you have uh, AI or ML right there on the edge. Um, so this slide talks about uh, benefits and challenges. Uh, there are challenges, for example, battery. Most of these devices, if they are not plugged in, for example, things like projector or a switch, then you have to supply the battery. But these microcontrollers are so energy efficient that one microcontroller running um, that simple 13 kilobyte of uh, model can last up to a year, one full year um, on a small coin battery. And there you're talking about a fraction of a milliwatt there. So it's extremely energy efficient. They don't require connectivity. There's no reason for the data to go anywhere other than the edge. And that's another power saving, right? Um, but again, um, they do require battery. So if you are um, uh, looking for something mission critical, you have limitation. You are looking for something in a space where or in a hard reaching areas, then replacing those could be a challenge. For example, farming. It's a good application of edge, but then if you're running on battery, it's a challenge. How many places would you go and change the battery? Yeah, yeah accelerators um, generally absent from these uh, microcontrollers, unless you go to $5, five zero kind of a device uh, where you have, um, you know, very uh, basic broadband GPU running few um, um, gigabits per second, gigabytes per second of operation. Um, 
devices. So um, I will show you one. Um, this is, like I said, this is one. Um, and it is kind of on the expensive side, has five different sensors from gyroscope to temperature to humidity to thermal. Um, and these sensors, they make it expensive. But the device itself is not that expensive. Um, so if you have just one sensor, for example, my, you can very well you know, have it uh, under a dollar or two dollar. Um, so these could be, you know, fraction of this or as good as, as large as your credit card. For example, Pi Zero is as large as your credit card and only thinner. And the benefit is uh, your privacy, right? I would not want my fingerprint to go and get stored in the, in the, so in the presentation earlier, we heard a convincing case of that. If you, if your fingerprint 125 points gets stolen, you can't change that. You'll have to lose your finger or something, right? So in some cases, privacy is very, very important. And we have talked and heard enough about that um, last presentation. Yeah, Facebook has a, has an open hardware project that's ongoing, and they are releasing, you know, very good um, um, IPs um, in the open source. Uh, you search Facebook open hardware platform, and you, you will get there. So there are quite a few companies. Um, the, the, the best thing uh, I like about microcontrollers uh, is their low cost and they are everywhere. They're mature, they're, they're low energy and, and they're flexible and they're reliable. They've been tested for over 40 years. It's not a new technology. It is mature to a point. If you can make use of that, you don't need any further investments, right? So what are we doing? We at AITS are uh, uh, designing a compiler that is tuned for these devices. Um, and I'm going to show you a, um, a demo as to how easy is it to use that compiler and put it in small form factor devices. And we have barely begun. Uh, we hope to make it easier and um, simpler for more devices. Um, right now, I am like it was hinted in the last presentation. ARM has a strong ecosystem around um, these uh, small form factor devices. So we are working with ARM. We are ARM partner too. Um, and um, if you have micro Python powered device, then you have, we offer inference framework as well. So anything under four megabytes um, uh, that our software will run in that too. And it runs on bare metal. If, even if you don't have OS, you can take the bundle and either flash it if it's wrong. And if it does have RAM, then it'll provide some kind of booting mechanism. So this is the URL. If you go to bit.ly slash DNN compiler with the capital C, it'll take you to GitHub page of where this is maintained. Um, you can download, feel free to change it, contribute to it, talk to us if you need help. We currently support um, close to 20 platforms, of different distributions, and we are hoping to increase that further. And most of that is automated. You will see on the page that whether with the build is passing or failing on a daily basis when the developers are um, checking in their code. So there is a rigorous process that we are following to make sure that the, the, the software that we are putting out is, is not a broken one. Uh, it's deep neural network compiler. This is what we started with um, two years ago. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it does run uh, ML algorithms as well. So our vision is simple. We are simplifying AI application deployments. Um, that in, we're focused on microcontrollers, but if you have a machine like a um, um, laptop, it's already a powerhouse for that kind of deployment. You can run it on any x86 power device today or ARM platform for that. So this is <clears throat> inference framework. So if you are an AI developer um, writing ML algorithms, we have a fantastic support, um, more than TensorFlow. TensorFlow Lite has 40 operator supports. We currently support over 120. And in the next release, we will be supporting 160. Um, so as we speak, we've already surpassed uh, TensorFlow um, Lite and Micro in their support of operators. And also our MicroTensor library, which is barely 12 operators. So. 
so TinyML is a, so we are part of TinyML too, right? Um, so they are also our partner. We are working alongside and other vendors like Arduino. So this board is uh, Arduino board. This is, so we are working with uh, vendors like, you know, who, who have um, microcontrollers and do provide the, the, the stack for that. So we are supplying um, the libraries and required infrastructure. So the, the URL that you see on the on the bottom it gives you an example as to how you can use it, use the inference framework. If you know Python, you know GNN compiler. There's no need to learn anything new. But there are tremendous examples and tutorials out there. And if you're using compiler alone, this is our use model. You bring out a model either in the Onyx, uh, TensorFlow, or Python, and uh, there's just this, this binary which takes the model. It will generate C++ code as an intermediate step. If you happen to be a programmer, would like to, tink to tinker around, look at that code. If you're not, and you don't want to deal with anything programming, you take the bundle at the end. So all the weights and biases are given to you as a form of bundle that you can either flash or upload somehow to your microcontroller. Depending on that type of microcontroller, they have different mechanisms. So this is what we give you today. No, we are in a way competing with TensorFlow. So we are way lower than TensorFlow. You can build TensorFlow on our library. Right. Correct. Yeah. So TensorFlow is a beast, right? It supports everything on the earth. Mm -hmm. then, Very popular one. Right. So what we are giving you is a C++ code that runs on any platform. Um, and a basic library, which uh, if you go back to uh, 95, uh, it'll be able to run the code from that uh, era of microcontrollers. Uh, TensorFlow doesn't do that. So our focus, yeah. our focus is on microcontrollers. So, uh, for example, TensorFlow requires 40 megabytes of memory, right, um, for it to boot up uh, GIT compiler. 40 megabytes is a huge memory for this. This has only 256 kilobytes, right? So it's like order of uh, you know, 1,000 times difference. So 256 megabytes, or you know, of the order of um, four megabytes, is huge for us. Um, so we are, uh, our sweet spot is where TensorFlow stops. It can't load up your model because the system is too small. We start from there. So Pi Zero is, uh, you know, this is a $5 computer, runs uh, SBM, a beautiful system, um, has everything for you. Uh, it is plugged, half a, half a watt uh, of power, and has quite a few ports. Um, so this uh, is a 30 second presentation as to how easy is it in terms of three steps that I showed you in the last slide. It's a, it's a video that will show you uh, how to compile your model for Pi Zero. So there's no... Something wrong? Uh, there is no voice here, so I would have to... Uh, so, so what what we are doing here is we are installing the DeepC, which is a package in Python um, on Pi Zero, and the next step is to use the compiler. The command is compile Onyx because the model is Onyx, it's MNIST. Um, so it takes that and compiles that into MNIST.exe right here, and we are running um, the demo. So this is uh, the demo that you saw. It's a uh, digit two, that true level was two, and model prediction is two. And this model, by by any means, is not small. So this is one slide to represent what's happening there, and this is more picture of like what was happening in the demo. So this is um, truly seven layers um, that's running on a very 
small device. And in terms of how much can it do, it's running over 100, 140 um, digits per second. So if you have other data sets like CIA FR, which is very popular in image processing, has been used in many of these uh, frameworks, it's similar to that. Um, and it can identify recognition based on the model that you give it. It's just one example. So if you have something interesting, what do you, you would like to do on Pi Zero or something similar, um, it, it's already there. Um, and in terms of the steps, um, we do generate C++. If you are curious, want to know what we are doing, it's a very simple model that we are generating. Um, feel free to tinker with that CPT file that we give you. Um, if you are not inclined, then you have an EXE that you can flash or upload somehow on your um, on your system. Uh, and so on the right hand side, you see the model that's being generated. Um, and you see that the operators, uh, there are five operators and it does pick and choose after the optimization as to which ones are required. It would do a um, good amount of optimization that I'm going to show you next. So this is all automated. You don't need to worry about it if you are not a programmer or do not want to understand that. It's just for the folks who are curious as to what's going on inside that. So we do support Onyx, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and Cafe. And uh, we have over 120 operators today. Uh, next release will have 160. We're supporting Onyx 1.5 and uh, all kind of graph optimizations that are possible on these graphs. Um, and we, we're using LLVM to compile this on x86 and ARM. And we are working with Sci-5 to support RISC-5 um, and other systems. Um, some of the uh, optimizations that we are doing, pruning, if there is an operator that's not used, we can just throw it away for inferencing. Um, fusion, um, some of these underlying hardware, they do provide um, more complex operators. Uh, and if your graph or network has support for this, then we would do um, fusion to improve performance. And uh, this is something new that nobody is doing, uh, partly because it doesn't work on all operators. But if you do split the matrices, um, then your memory requirement goes down. So if, if there is a, a, a neural network in one layer, if it requires 500 kilobytes and you only have 256 kilobytes, you are dead in the water if you're using TensorFlow or something similar. We do recognize that and we do that in parts if it's possible. So most of these operators, we support splitting and not all of them do. Um, and this is how in general it works. So you can divide the operators and do it one at a time. The downside you have, the downside you have is performance. So basically either um, it will work. So you have two choices that it doesn't work, right? Because the memory required is 500 meg and you only have 256. So the compiled model will fail, right? Or you can uh, choose to you know, run it slowly, right? So instead of um, 10 frames per second, one frame sec per second is acceptable to you or not, versus failing. No, no, no training. Yeah. So these are, <laughs> yeah, these are very small, uh, you know, uh, so this is only for inference. Training is, uh, What do you mean on chip? The inferencing? Yeah, it is happening on chip, right? Yeah. His question was training. Can we train a neural network on these smaller microcontrollers? Uh, no, yeah. not yet. <laughs> yeah, um, and of course, quantization, uh, which is very popular for uh, edge inferencing devices. So this is the end. Um, I hope that I have convinced you that AI is coming to the edge, and if you are interested, Feel free to check it out. If you have questions, come talk to me. No, no, no. These are the systems we are supporting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, like I said, these are uh, the cost goes on the basis of the sensors you have. The chips are 
very uh, inexpensive. Yes. No, we have written it from scratch. Um, so but this. Uh, but low operates on a higher, um, um, you know, um, data center kind of applications for training and, you know, larger systems. We are uh, focusing on smaller edge devices. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, OpenVINO also has a lot of memory, right? So, these are $100 devices that you're talking about, 100 to 250 dollars devices. We are operating from 10 cents to ten dollars. Microcontrollers and very small systems. So they don't focus on reducing memory like we we um, we go wild in terms of memory reduction to the last uh, bare bit that we have left. <laughs> um, so we have started. We are working with our uh, vendors and partners. Um, yeah, so if you have an idea that works on microcontrollers, we can help you achieve that. How do we make money? Good question. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, this is the world of open source. If you are closed source, um, like in the recent interview, Bill Gates said, you're going to die. Open source is the way to go. And only companies like Microsoft can survive, and even they are going open source. So, I guess you know, nice No, this is, yeah, use it as you please. If you have a commercial product, you would like to put this in, you know, it's all, it's all free. Take the product. There are, it, it has fun. Yeah, if you want us to put our effort, then yeah. I mean, and you go to make money, it's, it's only fair to give a part of that to us, right? And we put that back into the product. It's not that we are profitable or we're making a lot of profit. Yeah. So it's open and, um, like I said, um, 20 different uh, platforms, different distributions, um, PowerPC, ARM v7, um, v4, um, x86. We're working with the rest. Um, so let us know if uh, it excites you. Not started the conversation with Tencent yet, um, but they have their own compiler. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, no, so we are working with ARM. ARM has open ARMs. So you're, you're part of that. Yeah, we are part of ARM ecosystem. So they are working on Helium, and surprisingly, we are ahead of the Helium and the other projects. So we are part, I don't know because of that or despite that, but we are part of that ecosystem so far. Yeah. Thank you.